He came into the world, the world he created, fully human, fully God. But some people couldn't see it. He wasn't what they were looking for, born in a barn, no sword in hand, a man from Nazareth who taught us to take care of the least of these. He was totally unexpected, which is incredible because his people's own teachings were full of signs about him. He was, is, and always will be the one everything points to. But it wasn't just his life that people had a hard time seeing. He died, and then he came back to life. No one saw that coming. He suffered and he died, but now he is alive. And the depth of his love is poured out for all to see. Do you see it? So we have been in a new series over the last couple weeks called Jesus in Plain Sight. Guys, it's easy in times like this to sometimes, with all the noise, um, to kind of lose sight of where Jesus is at in the midst of things. It's easy sometimes to lose sight that God is working, that God is moving, that God is doing things. And a lot of that's it's because we, we tend to listen to other things more than we do Jesus. And that's not a bash, that's part of our human nature that... Sometimes we have to recalibrate and remind ourselves who we're supposed to be listening to. That doesn't mean that the news doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that what's going on in society doesn't matter. It does. But we have to be careful what the driving factor and what the motivations are in our heart. Because during times like this, when we have everything from COVID-19 to, to riots and civil unrest, people fighting injustice, political strife, Murder hornets. That didn't last long, though. That was like two days, right? Now it's Saharan dust. Right? 2020 just needs to go away. Right? It's been a crazy year, but it's like one thing after another. One thing I have found as a pastor is that during times like this, we tend to kind of dig into our core and cling to our deepest belief system. Like what you'll find is a lot of times if you find yourself extremely shaken in this moment and questioning faith and questioning um, where you're at, at your center, there's probably some doubt and some struggle there that has to be dealt with and recognized. We tend to go deep and reach into our deepest belief system, what's at our, the root of our heart, if you will. And sometimes these moments are good because they... They allow us to see where we're really at. They allow us to kind of dig in and recalibrate and take inventory of our faith and our relationship with Jesus. Guys, we live in a day right now that Christianity, I I personally believe, is on the brink of some change. The faith as a whole. I I think we're on on the brink of some, some recalibration even on the macro level of Christianity. We see a lot of things taking place. And right now where we're talking about division on racial or political lines, I believe that there's a bigger division in front of us if we're willing to look around. And that is something that's taking place within the Christian faith. A lot of times we don't even realize it because we don't really look at that. And I want to look at that today because as we've been started digging in, if we have trouble seeing Jesus... We need to look at who Jesus said he was, and we're digging into these I am statements. Guys, people assume that the purpose of religion is to some extent to have God as a helper who provides. To have God as one that kind of helps them find abundance or happiness, maybe even find material possessions, maybe the promotion at work, or inner peace and tranquility. 
A lot of times, this is what is sought, and if we kind of pay attention, you will find that type of language even echoed in a lot of sermons and messages today, is that kind of the purpose of what we're doing is connecting with a God that will raise you up, that will help you, that will help you find power and peace and purpose and joy and all these things. Now, is that true? Yes, there is some truth to that. Is that the center of who, what Christianity is? No, it is not. In fact, there's times that our faith won't bring peace. It may bring sword, according to Jesus. It may bring times of unrest. We have people in our very church that you accepting Christ has called, caused rifts in your family. Right? And sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes accepting Christ can bring persecution. This type of faith is dangerous because I, I, I've stood in barren walled rooms with, with Chinese believers, that their lives are falling apart, yet they're clinging to Jesus. The faith that is so often taught in Western society isn't the faith that they hold on to. Why? Because they don't see what we see. They don't look at what we look at. They see Jesus as the center of Christianity. I believe we see a rift happening because there's a new type of Christianity beginning to take hold, and I, I'm going to almost step to say beginning to rise to prominence in Western culture, and that's exianity. It's a form of Christianity, but without Christ as the center. Now, we may not necessarily see this, but as I begin to dig into this a second, I, I believe you may. There's a quote by Sylvia Collins Mayo, who wrote a, 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 a book about the, the, the upcoming generation and how religion is playing out within the, the newest generation, is she said it is not so much the Christianity in the USA is being secularized, rather more subtly, either Christianity is degenerating into a pathetic version of itself, or more significantly, Christianity is being colonized or displaced by a quite different religious faith. In other words, what this means is there is a new form of Christianity that's, becoming, that's beginning to kind of take root in what we know as the Christian faith. And this new type of Christianity is one that under the blanket of, yes, I believe in Jesus, yes, I'm a Christian, but yet Jesus is not the center of your faith. I see this all the time. And we must step back and ask ourselves in these moments that as we look for Jesus in troubled times, is Jesus the center of our faith? I think it's a valid question for every believer in these times. In America now, we live in a society that's somewhat spiritually marked by what one sociologist termed moralistic therapeutic deism. I know it's a big fancy word. Moralistic therapeutic deism. And basically this is a, almost like a worldview or a way of looking at things that to some extent is beginning to grow into Christianity. So let me give you a couple of things that kind of mark what this moralistic therapeutic deism is. One, a God who exists, who created and ordered the world and watches over every human life on earth. That sounds pretty right, right? That sounds pretty good. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by what most world religions. Once again, I think most of us could unite under that. I think God does want us to be good, fair. I mean, we know this. The center, central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. We take a pretty violent turn there, because nowhere will we see this, that the purpose of Christianity. But yet, if you talk to a lot of believers today, if they find themselves in a place of disrest or discontentment, they automatic believe, automatically believe that they're out of the will of God or that God has something or something's wrong. What about the Christian in some other country that's currently being beaten for their faith? Or have they done something wrong because their life isn't full of joy and excitement and good things? What about the Chinese Christians who, who put their heads up against hard wood blocks so that when they're punched in the face, their face have to absorb the entire blow, and they do this over and over trying to get them to denounce Christianity? Have they done something wrong? 
The quick answer would be no, they have not. Because why? Accepting, finding joy and happiness and everything going great has never been the center of Christianity. Jesus is. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. We see this all the time, right? We kind of pray occasionally. We, we even get the check marks on our Bible app, right? We kind of move along. God, I even like that song that comes on the radio from time to time, that good Christian song. I like the way it's laid out. But the t- only time I really, really invoke God and go to him and need him to be involved in my life is when I need something. Guys, I see this constantly. Number five, good people to go to heaven when they die. Good people go to heaven when they die. Now, I'm going to be somewhat transparent. This is kind of a difficult thing, but sometimes when you're a pastor and you do funerals, and you're dealing in a situation where the individual lived an entirely horrible life, and yet the family is standing, we're just glad they're in heaven. And I'm, I'm sitting there like, wow, what do I do here? This person didn't live for Jesus. There was no fruit of a relationship with Jesus in their life. The fruit of the Spirit was non-existent. But yet the family actually believes that this person was in good standing with the Lord. Why is that? That is because of a colonized faith that believes things untrue about their own faith. And this is sweeping through modern Christianity. We see it happening right now. We literally have people arguing over if it is Christian to not wear a mask. Seriously. I've, I've sat this week and been in several conversations with other pastors. I have personally been involved in conversations with four church splits this week over either COVID or Black Lives Matter. This is the arguments we're in. Why? Because Jesus is not the center of our faith. I'm not saying there's not a place for good discussion and conversation and decision making in these elements. There is. Is there room for the kingdom of God in the kingdom of God for churches to be splitting on over if it is literally mandated by scripture to wear a mask or not? No, this is when we have lost sight of what our duty is. This is when we have now put socialism over evangelism. Jesus must be the center. So this moral therapeutic deism and this thing is where morality is the center. We're supposed to be good. We're supposed to do good. We're supposed to make things happen. The therapeutic part is that there should be some level of therapy happening in my life that I should become, you know, be better. And when things aren't working, I search for ways to be better and do better. And we've removed the transformation of the power of the Holy Spirit out of our lives. I seek counsel before I seek God. I seek good books before I seek Scripture. There has to be a moment in where Christianity is not therapeutic, is transformative. And then deism. It's when there's the acknowledgement that there is a deity, that there is a God out there, but he's maybe not the center of my faith. I believe that this is a Jesusless belief system. I believe that this is an American spirituality that has no need for a Savior. Jesus has no place or value and sometimes is irrelevant at best. I believe it's warranted today. And and guys, I don't stand up here just because I needed one more talking point or one more sermon. I hope you know me better than that. I'm standing as a pastor involved in a lot of lives and not just within our church, but in our community and within the vineyard as a whole. And I'm time and time and time again, I'm in conversations where people are searching for truth without Jesus. They're searching for transformation without the Holy Spirit. They're searching for answers on purpose and meaning without God. There has to be a moment and we begin to question the structure of our faith. And my question for you today is, are you a Christian or are you a moral therapeutic deist? 
And don't be too quick to answer because they, we may surprise ourselves if we're not careful. That phrase was coined in a book called Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. This statement was written as an interview of a teenager when asked about God. And this, this was the answer, who is God? God is like someone that is always there for you. He's just like someone that will help you go through whatever you are going through. Now, that would be a lot of folks' answer today. Like, who is God to you? Well, he's this guy that's, he's grandpa. Right? He's this jolly guy in the sky that'll be there for me and will never turn his back on me, and he's just there when I need him. Is there some truth to that statement? Yes. God will, he'll, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He will always be there. He is faithful. He is just. He is, yes, 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 yes. But is that the, the center nature of who God is? No. That's an attribute of God. But if I begin to look at situations and I believe God is just this God that's there to help me get through stuff, then at that point I'm beginning to look at God incorrectly. Jesus kind of confronts and destroys this mentality in this I am statement. As we talked about the history of the I am statement last week in Exodus. And now Jesus beginning to use these I am statements in John 6, 35. It said, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Now, this is a huge statement. We talked about how last week that nothing Jesus says is on accident. And usually when Jesus says things, it's loaded speech, right? And this I am statement, the, 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 the Pharisees at the time and the religious people at the time knew exactly what he was talking about. Here's the thing. Jesus, once again, is throwing them some bait for them to be like, whoa, whoa. Keep in mind, this is later in chapter 6. In early chapter 6 is where we see Jesus feed the multitudes. All right? So now we're not too far removed from Jesus feeding the multitudes. And then he makes a statement that I am the bread of life. A couple key words right here, okay? One is bread, life, and believes. Bread. Now keep in mind, bread's a little different. Now I have to be honest. I love bread. I'm a, I'm a little bit of addicted to carbs, obviously, right? I mean, go to Red Lobster and get those cheddar biscuits. That's sin. They're good, right? I just like bread. I have to, like, limit myself. We'll go to mom. She'll put out garlic bread. I'm like, two. That's all I get. Because if I don't, I'd eat the whole thing like my son ends up doing, Right? <laughs> so it, i like bread right now keep in mind we like bread and br bread is somewhat easy and obtainable in our culture keep in mind it was the center of the food world during this time in fact a lot of meals just had to do with bread and wine and that was that was the extent of it it was literally the cornerstone of every meal was bread so it was a big deal because it was central to life and to nutrition. Now life, there's two different words that's used in Greek for this word life throughout Scripture that Jesus would use. Okay? One, one of them is just the word bios, which is where like we get biology, and this just means to exist. Right? Bios, biology, right? To exist. There's another word, though, for it means that means is zoe, right? That's where zoe gets her name, right? Greek for life. This doesn't mean just existence life. This means to live. To like actually to live. And there's a difference between being alive and living. Right? I think we could all understand that. And he doesn't use the word bios here. He uses the word zoe, which basically he's saying the bread of zoe. In other words, the bread that causes you to live. Not the bread that causes you to exist. There's a difference in what he's saying here. And then this word believe means literally to entrust yourself to another. Now, when we begin to dig into this, these words that Jesus is beginning to kind of say to a bunch of people that he just fed with bread and fish. Now, let's look at this. I'm going to fly through this pretty quick. John 6, 25 through 27. 
And you can follow along also in the Bible app under the Canvas section. Just hit events and then Canvas Church. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Now what Jesus says immediately here is that you're following me for the wrong reasons. Now let's first recognize they're following him. Right? They're following Jesus. They're excited about Jesus. They're like, man, this guy's awesome. And, you know, he just fed 5,000. He's doing miracles. Let's go follow Jesus some more. And Jesus is following Jesus more. And then Jesus is like, you guys are just following me because I'm doing cool stuff and feeding you. Right? This is basically what Jesus says. He says, you're following me for the wrong reasons. I, I believe that at times... We follow Jesus because we're looking for meet, him to meet our physical needs rather than give him our spiritual needs. Okay? I believe many times we are seeking his hands rather than his face. So I ask you that question. Are you seeking his hands or are you seeking his face? There, there's a difference, right? Because... Face is intimacy. It's to know someone, to see them, to look them in the eyes and to see them and know if they see you. Hands are just somebody giving me something I need. And many times this is what we're looking for God. And we see Jesus say this at this moment. Look, you're not seeking me because you truly believe I am who you think I am. You're following me because I'm feeding you and I'm doing cool stuff. Right? And Jesus begins to challenge this mindset that we see in our culture even today. Matthew 6, 28-29, And they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Look at their response. It was not, No, we want you, Jesus. It was, How can we do what you do? Wow. Now they're just not only saying, Yeah, we're not, they're, they're unashamedly, Yeah, we're following your works. How can we do your works? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he has sent. In other words, the work of God for you right now is to put your trust in me. Right? We looked at this concept, this word for believe is to put your assurance in someone else. Jesus is wanting them to actually trust him and to be dependent on him and to see him for who he is and put their life into it and not to chase him for what they can gain out of him. Moving quickly, John 6, 30 through 34. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we, that we may see and believe? You notice now they're just like, okay, great. Give us another sign then. We want to believe in you, Jesus. Can you do one more cool thing? Keep in mind, he just fed 5,000 people with a couple fish and a couple loaves. And then he says, you're just following me for whatever you can get from me. I want you to believe in me. Okay, well then what can you do for us so that we'll believe? Now listen to this. This is the exchange. Well, Jesus, do one more trick for us. Right? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out to heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but the Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. They're still just wanting stuff. Now, I'm not trying to bash them. What I'm trying to say is there is an innate wiring in the human condition that makes us chase after God for what he can give us. And it is something that if we are not careful, we'll fall into because we're all susceptible to it. Jesus said to them in verses 35 through 40, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, 
that you have, have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will um, never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. And this is the will of him who has sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that any, um, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now Jesus is getting spirit, like flat up spiritual with this, theological with it. He's saying, look, you guys are chasing all this stuff. But I'm here to do the will of the Father. And he sent me to be bread and to be life for the world. And if you'll look on me and truly believe on me, I'm here to bring eternal life and to raise up those that believe in me on the last day. Jesus is like doubling down in what he's wanting them to get from his message. And yet they continue to chase his hands and not his face. They continue to want to see what he can do rather than to see what he is and who he is. When people finally say they want the bread of life, Jesus tells them that he is the bread of life. It wasn't something that he would just give, it's something he was. Hear what I'm about to say. Jesus did not come into this world mainly to give bread, but to be bread. Now that is a central statement to what I started with. Jesus did not come to give bread, but to be read, bread. He is the center of our faith. Not what he brings, but who he is. Not what he does, but who he is. Not how he makes us feel, but who he is. Not if our life is going well and everything's in place, but who he is. Doesn't matter if we're in the valley or on the mountain, if we're in the midst of a storm or if everything's hunky-dory and we're running through, frolicking through fl fields with flowers and butterflies. It is about who he is. Like the crowd of the story, we often come to Jesus only to get what we can from him. The problem with this mentality is that God is not a mere helper to make our lives better. He is life Jesus did not come to meet our earthly desires he came to change our desires that's why Jesus would make statements to seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things what you eat what you wear what you need will be taken care of seek first the kingdom right Jesus was here to change our desires not to meet them all but yet we find time and time again that if the electric bill is not paid, faith is out the window. Guys, I see this all the time. That our faith is hinging on what's happening in the world or in our world. No, it's in who Jesus is. Do you see Jesus as useful? Or do you see him as a treasure? Years ago, I was in, in the 90s, I was in China. And, um, and, if you eat the wrong thing in China, it can turn bad really fast. Uh, when we went back in 2005, uh, we all did pretty well, but Zach ate the wrong thing one day. And we were out, and we're walking like 25, 30 minutes back to the hotel. And usually we have this rule, like when we have people with us, and some of the un unspoken is somebody's going to be up front, and one of the other kind of aware people are going to be in the back, and we're watching our surroundings the whole time. And like the rules went out the window like we're watching and zach's way out in front of us on his way to the hotel like <laughs> i'm gonna end the story right there you could put your own ending on that but when i was there in the 90s it was even worse and we, we just everything we ate and I, I got sick all of us were sick everything we were we ate we were we were throwing up we couldn't hold anything down and, um, you know, you just can't drink the water there. You've got to use bottled water for everything. And back in the 90s, there wasn't bottled water everywhere. There is now. And we st I stayed sick literally solid for three weeks. I forget, how, how many pounds did I lose? In like 18 pounds in three weeks. I literally just couldn't keep anything down until I discovered that some of their little stores carry these. Oreos. 
I ate more Oreos over a two-week period than is probably in any way, shape, or form healthy at all. Because I could hold them down. And they tasted good. And they reminded me of America. And now you can find all kinds of good stuff there in stores. But back then, this was it. And I would walk into stores looking for shiny blue wrappers with a word I understood. And I'm shoving them in my mouth. Nick, what is that? Oh, right? And I, it was just good. This to me was the bread of life. And I'm not even joking. Because I couldn't hold anything else down and I could hold this down and it was good and it gave me a little bit of strength. It was all sugar based, but it was at least giving me something. See, they're in this moment where Jesus is using this whole bread of life. There's a reason for this. He's literally paralleling the manna, right? Because they're like, well, what about Moses and the manna? They're bringing this up. And then Jesus is basically saying, no, I'm that. That was pointing at me. Right? I am the bread of life. That wasn't just something God did for you in the wilderness. This is something God is doing for you now. And I am He. Look at, let's skip down to verse 47 through 51 really quickly. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give him for his life of the world is my flesh. Now it just got real. Now keep in mind, in this moment, I'm going to paraphrase so I can move real quick because we're about to end. All of the people following begin to murmur. There were a lot of people that were with Jesus at this moment. Now keep in mind, we get in our brain that there was 12 Jesus, there are 12 people following Jesus, that there's like these 13 people scouring the mountainsides like the Lord of the Rings. No, there was actually a ton of people that followed Jesus. Right? There was a lot of them. He, Jesus had an entourage. And as he began to speak this stuff, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait, what? Nope, not doing that. All of a sudden, there began this question of following and getting. Let's skip down now to verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. To me, that is one of the saddest phrases in Scripture. When it came to the moment in which it was no longer about getting, but about following, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. It was too much for them to take on this understanding and this concept of taking on Christ and Him being the center of faith. It was too much for them to take, take that. And they left. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? You know, because Jesus was always trying to keep everybody. In other words, who's next? And then Peter, in Peter fashion, answered him, Lord, Lord to, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You notice Peter's response had nothing to do with what Jesus offers and everything to do with who Jesus is. You see that? Lord, to whom will we go? You're the one with the words that are speaking of eternal life. Not about loaves, not about signs, not about wonders, not about fish, not about miracles, but words of eternal life. And we have believed. We put our assurance in you that you are the Holy One of God. You're the one that's going to bring all this about. I believe there's a moment in which we need to ask ourselves this question, or, or better yet, maybe even kind of picture Jesus looking at us and say, will you go away as well? 
in a society that is looking to a new form of Christianity that is more about moralistic therapeutic deism than it is about Jesus. Jesus stands in the middle and says, I'm the bread of life. I'm here to give, I'm here to give eternal life. It was simple, it was clean. And it's not maybe fancy enough for us, but yet Jesus is standing here saying this. And I believe he's saying it to us this morning. Guys, we see something taking place in our world right now when I'm dealing with churches splitting over things that we should not be splitting over. We've seen it before. It's been in, the, in our history. And it's when we begin to allow religion to rear its ugly head and when we lose sight of who Jesus is and what our mission is rather than looking to the author and the perfecter of our faith. We lose sight of what God's called us to and who he is and how he's working and we begin to look at the wrong stuff. And certain things begin to put, we put on pedestals and guys in a lot of ways there are things that are very easy to look at and say, but what about that? And that's because they're important conversations, but they're not the center. They're not the point. They're not us worth splitting churches over. Jesus is the center. Jesus is the point. He's it. And if that's not enough for you, I don't know what to tell you because it's enough for me. Jesus is enough. He's always been enough. And we're losing sight of who he is and what he came to do and what he's doing in our lives and how he's called us into transformation and that he lives in us. And he's changing us from one point to another. And we're becoming like him. Not becoming like good Christians that fit into culture well. But we're becoming like Jesus. That is the point. John Piper said this. The cost of food in the kingdom is hunger for the bread of life. It's simple. Do you hunger? Do you find yourself desiring more of what he comes to offer or more of who he is? Guys, as I come to a close here, the older I get, the simpler some of this is becoming on the, you know, church is always complicated. Ministry can be complex. You know, no decision is going to work for 100% of people, and, and, and it's difficult. You know, I can say, hey, we're going to do this, and I'll get five emails cheering me on, five emails chewing me out, and then, you know, a bunch of people in the middle very quiet, and I don't know what they think. You know, church can be complicated. Ministry can be complicated. But the older I get when I look at my relationship with Jesus, it's getting simpler and simpler. Church is getting more complicated. It's more complicated when I started, even as a youth pastor 15, 16, 20 years ago. I look now and I'm like, wow, this is changing fast. This is, this is getting crazy. But then the older I get and the more I walk with Jesus, the simpler that part's becoming. And I'm like, Jesus, you're enough for me. Yes, I want miracles. I want you to work through me. I want to see blind eyes opened here. I, I want to see the lame walk. I, I want to see lives changed. I want to see addicts delivered. I want to see these things happen at the works of your hands because of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you. I want to see that. But more than that, I just want to know Him. I want to know Jesus. I want to be like Him more. Because He's enough. He's the bread of life. It's not about what he gives, but who he is. Guys, I, I want to take a, a second this morning and just reflection before him. 
please don't do what is tempting. And it's, all of us have done this in some way, shape, or form in our lives. Where I wonder who this was for. Or, oh man, I hope so-and-so's here and listening to this. Well, they're at the house, man. Man, I hope they watched the sermon this afternoon. They needed to hear this. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Instead, what I would rather is this. Who is Jesus to you? For real. Nobody else. Just you. Who is Jesus to you? A bunch of people quit following Jesus because he, he told them he wasn't what they thought he was. And then he looked at his disciples and said, who do you say? Like, we don't have anywhere else to go. You're the only one that gives eternal life. You are the Holy One and we believe in you. What is our response to that question? Is Jesus the bread of life that was broken for you? Does your life reveal that? Do you really believe that the good life is found in Him? If none of your earthly desires were granted, or if you were if they were ripped away from you right now, would you still follow Jesus? If we found ourselves hungry and without, would we still follow Jesus? He's enough. He's enough. You would stand with me. This morning, I want to take a, a moment in His presence and just invite the Holy Spirit into this place. It doesn't matter if you're kids or your husband or your wife, but kids, you too. You're not too young for this. Who do you think Jesus is? You've been taught in our classes that Jesus came and he died and he loves you and he, he lives for you and he's got promises for you. You're old enough to, to respond to this. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? I forget who it was. And we're going to pray. Years ago, we had somebody in our church that was trying to look a kid um, that was trying to find me after a service. And they're like, where's that guy with the beard? And they asked their parent, they're like, why? And they're like, who, who, Pastor Nick? No, I want to see Jesus. And they thought because I got up on the stage and talked that I was Jesus. And this little kid who was new to faith didn't understand that I'm far from Jesus. But in their mind, I can't wait to get to church because Jesus is there. Now, I, I'd have let that kid down pretty hardcore. But what if we had that same mindset of who, what if we truly believed who Jesus was and, and, and Jared just had to shut stuff down because we couldn't shut y'all up. Because you'd be so excited about who Jesus is. We let our weak define how good Jesus is or not. He's good. He's enough. Who is Jesus to you? We're going to take a moment in his presence. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit. Here's what I would ask you to do is answer that question. You, him, no one else. You find yourself majority of the time you're going to Jesus is when you need things or when you feel some sense of obligation because of religious expectations. You find yourself desiring his presence and to be more like him, to think like him, to speak like him. So I ask you today, who is Jesus to you? He stands before you and says, I'm the bread of life. My words are eternal life. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Lord, I just, we say, Holy Spirit, come, fill this place, fill our hearts. Lord, we just take a moment in your, your presence. And Lord, right now, while we're taking a break from laying on of hands and some of those things, Lord, right now, I just ask your Holy Spirit to grip us. As we take a moment in your presence, God, I pray that you would maybe tear away some of the things that would be in the way of uh, that would get in the way of real honest answers 
And Lord, as we take a moment right now, let us be honest in your presence and answer the question, who is Jesus to me? Who is Jesus to me? So Lord, as we take a moment in your presence, I pray that your Holy Spirit would highlight things in our lives. Let's be honest before you. Reveal yourself to those that don't know you. Speak to us. Take a few moments in his presence.